Clean Hands Save Lives. Written by Thierry Couset. Narrated by Jeff Burt. Chapter 4. The Multimodal Approach. Part 1. In 1998, Didier Pité accompanied his protégé, the jovial Stefan Harbarth, to the United States in the hope of finding a hospital willing to host him. During their tour, Barry Farr received them in Charlottesville, Virginia. Didier, would you be willing to give us a talk? As always, Didier agreed. He presented the Geneva model, still in the process of development. I was addressing the best team in the U.S. They bombarded me with questions. Two months later, Barry Farr was distributing alcohol in his hospital. He'd understood everything, or almost. But after an experimental period, Barry could detect no improvement in compliance. In an article which revealed a certain perspicuity, he blamed the failure on his haste. We need to emulate Pite, Barry concluded. So what was the Pite method? At the beginning of 1995, Didier needed to convince the personnel at the University of Geneva to adopt the alcohol-based hand rub concocted by William Griffiths. He did not imagine even for a second simply pushing the change through. At the age of 37, he was still a young service chief. No one would sign him a blank check. At that point, I thought of Pekub, he recalls. He was an old friend. Before my departure for Iowa City, we'd worked together on a project for a comic about catheter infections. I thought we might try something similar with hand hygiene. Pekub, or Pier Paolo Pugnale, a philosopher of communication, always brimming with ideas, suggested a different approach. He'd just drawn a calendar for the Roach Laboratories in Basel, explained Didier. It concerned accident prevention. Every month, their employees would flip to a new drawing. For example, February focused on skiing accidents, so Pekub suggested putting up posters on the walls of the different services. Didier went to find André Jacquemet, the hospital's head of logistics and one of its big bosses. He took a great liking to me. Didier spoke to him of his idea for a promotional campaign on hand hygiene and Pekub's proposal. Jacquemet suggested, you should contact my son. He's a psychologist at the university and interested in how people change their habits. He knows which methods work and which don't. He can help you. When he recounts this critical moment, Didier once again mentions how lucky he was. One, I had William, an alcohol expert, at my disposal. Two, there was Pekub, who gave me the idea about posters. Three, I met André Jacquemet's son, Stéphane. During the course of his visit to the hospital at the University of Geneva, Stéphane Jacquemet explained that in order to induce a change in behavior, you needed a multimodal approach. To get people to use seat belts, for example, it wasn't enough to simply install them in cars. You needed explanations, police involvement, and promotion. Didier was easily convinced. He came up with a five-pronged attack. One, changing the system. Make alcohol available as a substitute for soap. Someone offers us a new car without requiring us to use it. Two, training and education. Someone explains how the new car is driven. Three, regular measurements and reports on rates of compliance and infection, creating a feedback loop, as psychologists call it. Research shows that the better we're informed, the more we tend to comply with instructions, without it being necessary to apply fines or penalties for non-compliance. We need to know at what speed we're actually driving in order to have a chance to adjust that speed to the authorized limit. 4. Reminders and promptings through Pekub's posters and other communication tools. Reduce your speed. And 5. Firm support from management to promote a culture of patient safety. The government should help finance the new cars, agree to the installation of road signs, and encourage initiatives. Didier created a performance team which met every month to make decisions collectively. After all, the automobile drivers themselves are the best placed to write the highway code. Barry Farr neglected the last three points. During his initial trial in Charlottesville, he believed that changing the system would be sufficient, forgetting the human factors. As Semmelweis's misfortune demonstrated, a brilliant idea does not bring about a lasting change if it isn't promoted properly. Change cannot be imposed. 
It must be adopted by each of the hospital services, by each healthcare worker. I also apply the Pite method, sums of Valérie Sauvain. I never order anyone to do anything. I never talk down to people. I keep a low profile. I make factual observations without ever being critical. I've never had problems with anyone. Chapter 4, Part 2 In April 1995, Didier called together the doctors and nurses for a plenary assembly in the University of Geneva's large auditorium. I had enormous institutional momentum behind me. That was essential. He reported the results of the study carried out at the end of 1994. That was our initial snapshot. We knew the degree of compliance and the infection rates. Now all we had to do was improve our performance. To set the tone, some of Pekub's drawings illustrated the presentation. Chubby characters with a few hairs sticking up out of their heads, and in the background, a hospital in flames where germs are running around. A doctor forgets to cleanse his hands before treating a patient, but remembers to do so afterwards. The caption was harsh. Before, it's for him. After, it's for you. Compliance was indeed always better after contact with a patient. Protecting oneself comes more naturally than protecting others. We soon felt like we were coming under attack, recalled Marie-Noël Shreti. At the time, this intensive care nurse had not yet joined Didier's team. She relates how Pekub's posters caused controversy. It wasn't easy, being constantly called into question. The multimodal approach is great, but Didier ran into obstacles. To his face, everyone acted as if they supported Didier. But behind his back, there were moans and groans. His enthusiasm crushed everything before it, says Francis Farvogel. Sometimes we had to pick up the pieces. The posters were everywhere, in frames daubed with broad brushstrokes reminiscent of crisscrossed white bandages. It was impossible to pass by without seeing them. They looked like patches meant to save the health system. The metaphor grafted itself to people's minds. The walls were starting to speak. We had to replace the posters twice a week to vary the messages, explained Didier. He needed goodwill on the part of everyone. One day at four in the morning, he met with the hospital's cleaning staff as they were finishing their rounds. It was the first time a professor had ever come down to see them. Didier explained the object of the campaign and the value of hand hygiene. He received rousing applause. We'll make sure your posters are pasted up, a member of the cleaning staff said. Pekub drew more than 250 of them. In one, a doctor is seen plunging headfirst into a vat of alcohol. The caption reads, After the examination, decontamination. In another, five hairy viruses are laughing together in bed. If your hands aren't clean, here in bed we get mean. One more advised, Trim those nails, or we germs set sail, above a hand whose fingers resemble rocket launchers. Didier arrived in his office one morning just as the telephone rang. No, Pite, this poster goes too far. You must take it down right away, growled a man with a strong African accent. The image put up the night before showed a bacterium coming out of a coffee machine, with the caption, There's no break for a small cup of black. During their monthly meeting in the 10th floor cafeteria, the performance team had approved this poster. No one had seen any racist implications in it. The important thing was to react quickly in such cases, Didier says. The following day, another image appeared. Two doctors are shaking hands, while gluttonous microbes jump from one to the other. The caption read, Transfer of Power. Or perhaps it was a surgeon in green scrubs, getting ready to draw his two guns to blow away a virus. Disinfection, it's right there in your pocket. A reminder to everyone to carry a bottle of alcohol-based rinse or gel on their person at all times. People started writing on the posters, expressing their grievances. You watch while we work. But there were also touches of humor. More Valérie, less Bactri. Pekub developed a theory. It was hospital street art. You should let it happen. You should even encourage it. He created new posters with spaces left empty for comments, and then went round the various units. His hidden motive was to spend time with the nurses whom he adored. He questioned them and turned their messages into images, indicating the service where the area had originated at the bottom of the poster. 
Pekub liked to foster team pride. The doctor coming out of the men's room zipping up his fly. Did you remember to clean your hands? Retorts to another doctor, fleeing from an infected zone with black streaks trailing behind him. In your shoes, I wouldn't talk. Pekub's posters stimulated discussion, but made people uneasy. The hospital workers continued to complain. To appease them, Valérie Sauvain went to see Didier's sister Ariane, a painter and professor of fine arts. I was very impressed when I faced this woman who was much more mature than me, splendid and renowned. She put her students to work on hand hygiene. We exhibited their work in the hospital, keeping them on the walls for a long time. I asked the technical service to help me hang them. It was really nice. I had the feeling I was doing ten different sorts of jobs, and enjoyed all of them. Everyone was accessible. If you wanted funding, you knocked on the door of the person responsible, and you came out with a budget. The program worked because the hospital itself worked well. Sauvain returned to the hospital. She saw a deformed image of her face on the walls. Didier is going to kill me. What did I do wrong now? She went up quietly to her service. It was a joke played on me by Sylvie. She's very good at those. Sometimes there was tension among the nurses with their strong personalities, each of them seeking to outdo themselves. But no one ever lost sight of the pleasure of working together. Every six months, Didier reported the results in the big amphitheater. When he announced that nurses performed better than doctors, cries of joys were met with whistles. Then he compared the different hospital units, another explosion of cries. Everyone played the game, Didier said. There was a fantastic degree of completion. Lots of people came to the performance team's meetings with ideas. Each of them was adapting the strategy in order to better implement it. One day, excessively happy with the campaign's success, Didier jokingly suggested that from now on, they could fill the sinks with ice to stock cans of soda there, implying they no longer used any useful purpose. Many people were shocked, said Marie-Noël Shreti. Didier likes to be provocative. On the other hand, she is unable to remember when she herself switched from soap to alcohol. She's not alone in this. Despite everything, it all happened quite smoothly. The campaign worked all the better because self-interested individuals cleaned their hands to protect themselves, while altruists did it to save lives. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde both had their reasons for complying. The individual rubs elbows with the collective, and perhaps that is a necessary condition for widespread change to occur. We have a hard time acting on behalf of the planet because we generally don't see any immediate benefits in doing so. Things look different, however, once climate imbalances affect us directly. We're finally starting to link the personal and the collective. And hand hygiene has that rare power of uniting the two sides of the human coin. Didier faced all kinds of difficulties in carrying out what he considered to be a mission. Whereas Semmelweis was a revolutionary, Didier is a missionary, concluded Marie-Noël Chreti. Chapter 4 Part 3 Making a gesture as simple as cleaning one's hands into an historic innovation certainly requires a special kind of personality, a connection to people and to the most ordinary ideas, an open mind combined with an innate goodness. All of these are qualities which can be traced back to childhood. When Didier was born in March 1957, Robert and Fernanda were living in a tiny apartment, which they soon exchanged for a quiet house in Petit Lancy, outside their electrical shop. Robert was quiet, reserved, very traditional, and devout. For her part, Fernanda found fulfillment in community work. They spent much of their free time involved in the activities of the Christ Roy Parish. On long weekends, they climbed up to La Folie, an alpine village perched at 1,600 meters at the end of Valforet, in the Swiss canton of Valais, where a generous donor had bought a bankrupt hotel in order to turn it into a cooperative summer camp. The site offered an unobstructed view of a glacial valley, and there were immaculate meadows bordered by rows of pine trees. It would have been almost idyllic if the hotel's roof had not been threatening to collapse. The whole place needed to be renovated. Robert persuaded his artists and friends to pitch in. Fernanda busied herself in the kitchen, Didier, soon joined by his sister Ariane, then his brother Denis, and a host of other children, 
played in the fresh air of the Valais Mountains. When the camp of La Foulie opened in the summer of 1962, run by volunteers from Petit Lancy, Didier was one of the first to join. The priest led them on hikes. He instilled them with a love of physical activity, making the stronger children walk behind the weaker members of the group so that everyone would reach the summit at the same time. Caught up in this dynamic, Didier became an altar boy without even thinking about it. On Wednesdays, there was catechism. On Saturdays, Boy Scout meetings. Together, the children played soccer, went to summer camp, sang during Mass. On days when there were funerals, the parish priest would pick up Didier from school to participate because he didn't giggle during the service. The curate had him read the sacred texts. A recruiter, he raised the possibility of Didier starting religious training at a Catholic minor seminary following primary school. Fernanda had no objections, but it was too far away from Petit Lancy, and Didier preferred to go to school with his friends. Several years later, when Didier's grandfather, his father's older brother, decided to become a Benedictine monk, Didier accompanied him to Tammy Abbey in the Savoie region of France. In this austere building on the heights overlooking Albertville, he woke up in the middle of the night to attend the morning service, praying silently and singing the chants. He shivered as he watched his godfather walk away, called by God, but did not follow him. He was friends with the son of his family's doctor. Didier spent a great deal of time in the home of this quiet man, who was always ready to respond to an emergency. Even for the hundredth time on a Sunday, Didier sensed there a profession, a vocation, a calling. At Tami, Didier chose his destiny. He loved people too much to devote himself exclusively to God. Another path beckoned to him. Rather than a minister of souls, he would be a healer of bodies. And so he found himself a quarter of a century later with his pilgrim staff roaming through the hospital of the University of Geneva's services preaching hand hygiene. But soon the World Health Organization would be knocking on his door and he would be traveling all over the world motivated by the same faith. Chapter 4, Part 4 In 2000, by the age of 43, Didier had become an authority. Benedetta Allegranzi, a young Italian woman specializing in infectious diseases, was one of his students. Three years later, back in Geneva for a six-month mission at the WHO, she was working on resistance to antibiotics. It was at that moment when the first outbreak of SARS took place. This type of pneumonia, caused by a coronavirus, emerged in China and spread across the planet during the spring of 2003. I was transferred to the team monitoring the infection because SARS involved a high rate of nosocomial infections. I was dismayed. The WHO lacked the resources to fight it. Allegranzi didn't dare contact Didier, who was working only a few kilometers away on the opposite shore of Lake Geneva. She felt bad due to her helplessness. I was too ashamed, she confesses with emotion. At the end of her mission, she returned to Verona, where she learned that a small amount still remained of the funds released by the Italian government for use by the WHO. I proposed organizing an international conference on patients' safety. During its 55th World Assembly in May 2002, the WHO had voted a resolution on this subject without taking any action. Everyone agreed that this was important, but nothing had been done since then. The conference took place in Venice, Italy in April 2004. There Didier met Benedetta again, along with colleagues and WHO officials. The minutes of the discussions reached Sir Liam Donaldson, the chief medical officer for England, a member of the WHO's executive board and an expert on patient safety. He's a magnificent person and physician, a surgeon by training who later became involved with public health. Someone really well qualified, Didier says with enthusiasm. A fine man. He was putting together a crack team to tackle the problem. He'd sent his spies to Venice. In a way, it was Benedetta who made it all happen. Joining Donaldson in this effort were Donald Berwick, who later became President Barack Obama's administrator for Medicare and Medicaid. Lucien Leap, author of the seminal article Error in Medicine. Dennis O'Leary, head of the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations in the United States. And James Reason, a risk theorist and inventor of the Swiss cheese model. Accidents occur when several causes converge, 
or, metaphorically speaking, when several holes in a piece of Swiss cheese become aligned. In October 2004, Donaldson and his team announced at a ceremony held in Washington, D.C., the creation of the World Alliance for Patient Safety. They knew that improving the planet's healthcare situation would take years. They envisioned setting a challenge every three years in order to motivate the medical community. To head up this project, we needed a leader who was scientifically renowned and respected, Donaldson explained. I knew of Didier's work in Geneva. He was the ideal person to turn to for help. Donaldson went to see Didier in Geneva. We spoke for an hour. Didier was overflowing with energy and ideas, but remained humble and respectful of others. I left his office convinced that he was the right person to take up our first global patient safety challenge. When Donaldson called him back to propose that he take charge, Didier accepted on one condition. First of all, I need three years to evaluate the burden of disease worldwide. He was afraid that he might have overlooked some risk factors. He wanted to measure the scale of the problem before putting the best strategy in place. He was thinking of intolerances and allergies. But Donaldson was categorical. It's 2004, and you have to launch in 2005. We can't afford to waste time. Didier realized what he was really saying was, it costs more to measure infections than it does to prevent them. Even so, he consulted with Sir Ian Chalmers, the father of systematic studies on health systems and founder of the nonprofit organization Cochrane Collaboration. He was a scientific researcher noted for his rigor. Didier deplored the fact that no large-scale study of hand hygiene existed. Donaldson is pressing me to make an early start. Chalmers looked at him with a faint smile. In this field, we don't need any more studies. Go on, just do it. Didier started by adjusting the multimodal strategy so that it could operate in any healthcare establishment. Speaking directly with each and every hospital director on the planet was out of the question. We needed tools so that everyone could implement the strategy themselves, Didier said. He remained true to his pacifist approach. Never impose anything. Offer the possibility of change. Educate and incite. Hope that it comes about of its own accord. Dictators try to control everything. Pacifists share their dreams with the community. Dictators impose a single path. Pacifists show that there are several different paths. They stretch the strings of their harps in the hope that a polyphony played by millions of hands will arise. The WHO was lacking in means. The 16 million patients who were losing their lives every year to nosocomial infections did not weigh heavily in the balance. Despite its urgency, this battle was of little concern to politicians. Didier very quickly received proof of this. He did not even have funding to hire a communication agency to create a poster explaining how to clean hands properly. So he consulted his oldest son, Florian, a student at the École Cantonale d'Art et Lausanne, the leading Swiss school of art and design. He came up with the idea of showing the gesture from the point of view of the person who performs it. He positioned himself above us while we cleansed our hands and photographed us. Using these photos, he drew our hands, decrypting all the gestures, step by step. On a shoestring budget, with the help of his colleagues at the hospital and the WHO's support, Didier was ready to launch the program with full fanfare on October 13, 2005. Before the big day arrived, he'd lost 10 kilos in weight and was taking sleeping pills to make sure he got some shut-eye. He walked up to the WHO's podium with disheveled hair and hollowed cheeks. He tried to forget the fact that Brigitte had just left him and draw from his inner reserves the enthusiasm needed for the forthcoming battle, treating all of the world's hospitals. His personal problems mattered little compared to the suffering of millions of victims of nosocomial infections. You are the dream team, he called out to the delegates who had come from the four corners of the world. Better hygiene means better treatment. Clean hands are safer hands. Didier had picked up his pilgrim staff. Some simple gestures can save lives. Every patient has the right to live.